Um, and um, okay, for Alex, then uh, he's a master's student in the electronic engineering with space systems uh, at the University of Surrey. Um, and today uh, he's going to be introducing us on how can we improve the fault tolerance of commercial and off-the-shelf devices such as the Raspberry Pi and make them suitable for use in a space environment. So super interesting talk about dual redundant CubeSat flight computer based on Raspberry Pis. And with that, Alex, the floor is yours um, to indulge us. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, as you said, I'm Alex and with me is Dr. Chris Bridges at the Surrey Space Centre. Um, we want to talk about some of the work we've been doing about creating this onboard computer based on the Raspberry Pi platform. Uh, and this is something that's been under development for a while now. Um, but today we want to launch it as open source and get your opinions on what's happened so far. Um, so here's a quick overview of what we're planning to do. Uh, firstly, we'll be talking about where this design's come from, why it exists, and then looking at some of the implementation itself. Uh, I'm hoping there'll definitely be some content in there that is of interest, even if any of you aren't necessarily interested in Raspberry Pis. Uh, and then we'll kind of look at a system overview, a uh, function breakdown of some subsystems, and then wrap up by just looking at some characteristics in general. Um, so firstly, I'd like to just ask Chris to give a quick background on the arrest mission, which is where this has come from. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Chris Bridges. I run the onboard data handling research group at Surrey Space Centre. Um, with many of the uh, student projects that we have going on at the Space Centre, um, we usually do these in relationship to missions. Um, and one of the missions that we were working towards um, was called the Arrest Mission, which is between uh, Caltech, um, working in collaboration with NASA JPL, and IIST in, in India. Um, and the purpose of this mission was to work and build autonomous reconfigurable sp space telescopes. Um, and so what we were using is using a central core, which was roughly about a 6U, um, possibly even a 9U. Then that we had some attached 3U units that we could then move around. So the systems that we designed um, are visual navigation systems, propulsion systems. But of course, we need the computing to go behind this uh, and the grunts to go behind this. Um, and so Alex is uh, one of many students who's been able to then sort of build and develop um, and what we sort of do, uh, uh, sorry, and certainly in my research group, is we get opportunities to fly things and we get opportunities to do some really exciting uh, tests. Um, and Alex is the sort of culmination of that. So there's been a number of students behind that working towards this. Um, but I'm so proud of him and I hope, uh, you know, you all can, can bask in, in, in what he's been able to achieve and we're looking forward to some comments. Alex. Okay, hey, brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Um, so. I want to start off with a quick discussion of why Raspberry Pis might be a good idea for space missions. Obviously, I'm not here to try and sell the Raspberry Pi to you, so this is just my personal opinions on its suitability. Um, it is kind of common sense stuff, really. So the advantage is that, you know, really it's an inexpensive platform. It's quite simple to develop with because it's self-contained. And obviously there's a great community out there of, you know, open source people and hobbyists as well. Um, and that's really nice because if you have a problem with your own project, you know, it's quite likely someone else has already done that and fixed it for you. Um, also, these things can be quite powerful. So as well as an ARM microprocessor, you've also got a GPU on board um, and that can let you do all sorts of very efficient fun things with image processing and you know, vector calculations. Um, the disadvantages, again, kind of self-explanatory because um, it's got hardware, it's vulnerable to radiation effects. Uh, now we have done some radiation testing at Surrey. I know other places have it as well. Um, Raspberry Pis do hold up quite well under radiation, I think it's fair to say. Um, but obviously, they're still vulnerable to things like single event effects and latch up. Um, so it's something that's definitely worth thinking about still. Um, yeah, it's also quite hard to physically integrate a conventional Raspberry Pi because of its form factor. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've got ways around this. So, yeah, our solution to doing this is firstly to try and combat that um, radiation issue by using redundant Raspberry Pis and then adding circuitry around them to support them on a single board. Uh, and then using the Raspberry Pi compute module, which is a lot easier to integrate than a normal Raspberry Pi. Um, it's basically got an edge connector and it's just a very small board, which you can quite easily fit two of onto a single PC 104 size board, which is ideal. Um, so you can get an idea of what this actually looks like here. Um, this is kind of the evolution of this board. So it, as Chris said, it's a series of student projects over the last six to seven years, um, different students every time. So it's gone in some slightly different directions over time. Um, but it's evolved from what was initially quite a basic concept to something that's really quite tailored for arrest. And it's got some very niche features down here, such as an inter-satellite Wi-Fi link, which was necessary, 
and then also uh, Raspberry Pi camera support as well. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the more standard things like I2C and UART support. Um, theoretically, of course, because that's quite a limited subset of all the buses out there, it is quite straightforward to add more buses onto that, depending on what the Raspberry Pi can support itself. Um, and also changing the connect pin out to meet that PC104 definition that I see Pierre was talking about in the chat now. Um, but yeah, the key thing to discuss here is really that in each of these iterations, there's always been some kind of onboard controlling device. And there's always been some kind of supply protection system. Um, so in version four, which is where we are now, what we're presenting, we're focusing on a digital supply monitoring system that really implements the entire redundancy scheme for us. Um, so here's a quick system overview. Uh, on the left there, you've got the system architecture diagram. And on the right hand side, there's some pictures of the board. But I've actually got the real thing here myself. Um, so what you can see is we've obviously got these two compute modules on top. And on the bottom of the board, we've got all of the support hardware that you can see in that architecture diagram. Um, what we're going to do is just go through some of these in detail in a moment, but I want to point out some key features here. Uh, obviously, we're centered around these Raspberry Pis. Uh, they're connected to the PC104 bus via multiplexers. That allows us to switch between the Pis and implement the redundancy that we need. Um, we've also got a uh, microcontroller here, which is handling all of the switching for us. Um, and as I said, again, that is really doing the monitoring and implementing the redundancy. Uh, we've got an Ethernet link between the two devices, which is quite important because um, it allows us to transfer data when running in a hot redundant mode. Uh, and then lastly, we've got our fun features, so our cameras down there and our Wi-Fi up here. Uh, so without further ado, I want to talk about the system monitoring system. Um, and this consists of quite a few elements on the board. So we've got three regulator blocks, effectively, um, to power the Raspberry Pis and then also the Wi-Fi chipset. And each of these has a bank of current monitors built into them. Um, and these then talk to an analog to digital converter, which is then feeding us data back into our microcontroller that we can then use to keep an eye on what's going on with the system. Um, I mean, the key idea really is just to monitor as much as we can. And if we see anything non-standard or suspicious, then we can take action to both keep operating securely and safely and also protect our hardware if we need to. Um, so as I said, all the regulator outputs have supply current and voltage monitoring. Um, so if we saw something such as, you know, a sudden high current, we might conclude that we've got a latch up condition. What we can do then is shut that down as fast as possible to try and protect our hardware, switch over to our other system, which can act as our backup, and then hopefully allow us to continue operating with a minimal loss or delay. Um, we've also got some status signals coming from our Raspberry Pi. Um, the most interesting one being this heartbeat signal, uh, which is effectively periodic and it acts like a watchdog. So if we stop seeing edges on that, then we can assume we've had something like a functional interrupt or our Raspberry Pi has become unresponsive and again, switch to our backup system. Um, we've also got some monitoring systems on our Wi-Fi system, but I'm just going to gently brush over them because we're running out of time. Um, so what we want to do is implement our redundancy scheme. So the microcontroller basically controls everything on the board. So regulators, Pi's, multiplexers, it's responsible for just overseeing everything and selecting the active device. Uh, we're using an FRAM microcontroller here, um, and that's because FRAM does have some innate tolerance to radiation. Um, and this specific part, um, MSP430, was actually chosen because it's got a rad hardened variant that's also pin compatible. Um, that is quite an attractive thing because uh, this microcontroller is potentially a single point of failure. So being able to use something more robust there if we need to is something that's really great for us in terms of protecting our more complicated hardware. Uh, moving on, I want to talk about the Ethernet Crosslink Connect, which is the other big part of implementing our redundancy scheme. Um, basically, we want to be operating what we call warm or hot redundancy. Uh, and this is where one of our Raspberry Pis here is the active device, and the other one is acting as a backup. And what we want is to be able to keep that synchronized so that it is up to date and can take over pretty much immediately with no loss of state or anything if the first device fails. Um, and that requires us to have kind of fast data transfer between the two. Um, just to let us do that synchronization in real time. Um, so using Ethernet for this is quite a low risk approach because it's already used on Raspberry Pis, um, but it's not actually implemented on the compute modules themselves. Um, so we've had to do this ourselves. Now, the schematics for the Raspberry Pi Model B, which we see here in the top right, um, are actually in the public domain. So what we did is just basically take the circuitry for the USB Ethernet chip off there and implement it ourselves on our own board. Um, now, this does give us an Ethernet link here that you can see in the bottom, which is only a couple of centimeters long. Um, we do have two transceivers that are very close together. So it's kind of overkill from a hardware perspective. Um, but it should just work in theory, and it does, which is great. We get an operational link um, that's giving us almost 95 megabits per second, which is great. 
because that lets us transfer data forwards and backwards as much as we need. Um, I think I'm just going to quickly skip over the Wi-Fi and we can come back to that if anyone has some questions, uh, just in the interest of time. Um, so the last thing I really want to go to in detail is this Raspberry Pi camera support. Um, and this is quite interesting in how it achieves redundancy by supporting two cameras. Uh, and the reason for this is that traditionally the Raspberry Pi can't do this. Um, so again, a lot of multiplexing is going on here. Um, we've got lots of buses involved. So there's a camera serial interface bus, and then we've also got I2C and GPIO, and all of those need to be switched to be able to make this work. Um, so there are some specialized multiplexing devices being used there. Um, but you know, depending on how it's set up, um, it can give flexibility and hardware redundancy. So what we're doing here is cross-strapping, and that means we can connect any Pi to any camera at any time. Um, Again, that's great because it gives us that flexibility to deal with you know, a failed camera or a failed Pi, whichever way around it is. Um, we can even hot swap the cameras in use, which again is not something that Raspberry Pis officially support. Um, but we found it works absolutely fine and it seems to be pretty much flawless. Uh, we functionally verified this. Uh, and this here is just a quick image to prove that you can actually take photos with this and it does work. Um, but obviously, you know, there was quite a lot of engineering in the background to really get the signal integrity needed to make this work. Um, so just moving on to some characteristics. Um, here's a picture of the board in testing. Uh, as you can see, it's operating on 5 volt and 3.3 volt supplies. Um, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, yeah, the board is quite power hungry, um, mainly just because you know, Raspberry Pis are very hungry devices. So we need about 10 watts peak with everything on the board running. Um, for us, that happened to be fine, but I understand that for other people, that might be quite a lot of power to supply. Um, you know, there are things you can do, so you can just run one pi at a time effectively in cold redundancy, um, and that only needs five watts, but you're trading off the capability there, really. Um, and for us, the, the next steps for getting this working uh, are really focusing around the thermal profiling um, and RF testing, things that we need to be in a lab to be able to do properly. Um, and that's just kind of an outcome of COVID, the fact we haven't been able to do this yet. Um, and also because I was focused on the hardware, mainly for this project, um, there's still quite a lot of software that needs to be developed for enabling the Raspberry Pi to work redundantly and to get that MSP430 working properly. Um, so just onto the final slide as time sort of slips away from us. Uh, if you want to get involved, um, all the designs are freely available on our GitLab, which is here. Um, that includes all the original design projects, schematics, Gerber's reports and documentation. Um, and now for the slightly less good bits, if you want to look at it this way. Um, this wasn't initially designed with open sourcing in mind. So uh, I used Altium Designer to design this, which is kind of as far from open source as you can get. When it comes to PCB design. Um, now there are various converters out there for going to other file formats um, and I am planning on doing a proper conversion to KiCad or a similar file format in the future. Um, and it's also you know, a fairly challenging board to assemble, um, mainly just because of all the complexity that's gone in and trying to squish the circuitry onto the board. Um, I managed to put the whole thing together with a hot air gun and a soldering iron at home. Um, so it is doable, but possibly not for the faint-hearted. Um, it's a good challenge either way. Uh, and lastly, it's a relatively affordable board to have fabrication put together. Um, we designed it for using the JLC PCB fabrication process, um, which means you can get boards fabricated for seven euros a piece, which is great. Um, although the components are a little bit more than that, obviously. Uh, I see Pierre was asking for Q&A. So there we go. Thank you very much. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Excellent. And right on time. So thank you, Alex, for uh, introducing us to your awesome project. Um, and let's start with some, well, uh, shamelessly, the first one is my question uh, around uh, joining for the, yesterday we had a discussion around PC 104, right, and the common definition. And it would be great if, since you're developing an open source, you know, board, um, you know, join the discussion. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that would be a great idea. Um, it's probably something for Chris to deal with more because I know he knows the PC104 pinout on that board better than I do. Um, but, you know, we can even change it if we want to be compatible with whatever the outcome of um, your discussions are. That's absolutely fine. There was um, a discussion in about 2015, 2016, about how we can homogenize sort of all of these connectors um, back when SSC was first doing its first CubeSats. Um, it might even be older than that, actually. And actually, to get manufacturing to fall to one thing um, is, is quite hard. Um, and personally, there are probably better connectors than PC104 that can still maintain um, 
the, the number of pins and the mechanical stability that these things uh, actually are used for um, is quite big for what it actually is. Absolutely. And talking about connectors, there's a, uh, a related question to that about the pipe board that are on the mezzanine uh, connectors, right? And um, would that be an issue for space, like mechanically speaking? Yeah, potentially. Um, so obviously, this is kind of a, a gold contact connector. So it's, um, it's kind of sprung in a way. Um, it's Do not you want to go back a slide? Yeah, oh, and then yeah, you can quite, see yeah, it. Yeah. Um, there we go. Yeah, so here you can see we've got this edge connector all the way along here. Um, and that's just effectively on kind of you know, touching contacts on both sides. Um, the answer is yes, in terms of vibration, that is an issue. Um, but I mean, in an actual flight configuration, this pie would be securely bolted down at this end of the mounting holes. Um, so it's fairly likely that in an actual you know, operational flight scenario, i.e. not a launch, um, the vibrations may be benign enough that it is fine. If not, then obviously you can reinforce it with various epoxies and compounds. Mm. Like what, what, yeah, what I would say is what we what we would usually do and the things that we have to be careful of are, are things around conformal coating. And then there's there's a particular um, epoxy that we use in lots of our spacecraft called DP190, which is a horrible thing to use because it's really hot off. But once it's on there, it can really tie things down. So the edge connectors, we would uh, epoxy down. Um, and we'd also need uh, one of the things we need to investigate is whether or not we need the thermal strap to go across the processors. So whether or not these mounting holes here are kind of appropriate for that is something that we just haven't been able to do because unfortunately the, you know, during Alex's project was uh, impacted by the, the pandemic. Um, but that's the sort of next thing we want to test in the new year. Hopefully when all of our labs slash vaccines start to call, um, become more available. Uh, another question around the compute module. Uh, we can see that you're using compute module three. Uh, and what's your take on compute module four that is out now? Um, hopefully, we have some bonus slides here. Yeah, here we go. Um, so I kind of anticipated this coming um, because it's been kind of all over the news recently. Um, my take is that realistically, um, it's definitely a direction that could be kind of moved into. Although talking about connectors, it's using these very fine. Kind of mezzanine connectors, which are potentially even worse than the edge connectors we've already got. Um, I think there's a little comparison about why well, we might want to do this here. Um, but yeah, it, it can do things more functionally. It might simplify the actual you know, carrier board itself. Um, but again, you know, the connector strength, um, it's actually harder to do the monitoring of the power systems on there as well. Uh, and also it's got no flight heritage. So um, as far as we're aware, there have actually been compute modules flown in space um, of the you know, compute module mm -hmm. one, compute module three style. Um, so that would be something that would be kind of you know, disregarded if you did want to use this. Yeah, of course. What we've we've been able to do is we've we've done thermal, vacuum, and radiation tests on particular versions. And of course, every time you make a change, it invalidates all your testing. Um, so how how kind of open source communities manage that level of risk, especially when they want to move up and do more exciting and more things um, is something for everyone to think about. Excellent. And uh, can you speak, uh, I guess, as a final question, a bit about the Wi-Fi inter-satellite link? Is it yeah. among the satellite itself or between satellites, uh, the different satellites, if yeah. they fly information? Actually, let me go all the way back to the arrest picture at the beginning. Um, so the way this basically works is that you've got a core satellite, which is sort of the part you can see in the middle here, and um, it's got this boom. And you've got these two what are called mirror sats and the idea is these need to be able to undock move around and do things like formation flying and redocking in different configurations um so the inter-satellite link is basically just to allow all of these to talk to each other um i'm quite happy to talk about um the implementation of that later if anyone does want to know about that yeah i guess just very briefly that the main docking port interface it, um uses uh, electromagnetic um, docking systems to actually allow us to move things around. So we've actually done full uh, simulations of the electromagnetic docking. So we can actually undock them um, uh, first to begin with, and then we have to kind of turn on these quite very power hungry electromagnets as well. So the, the Raspberry Pis are there because we actually have some pretty heavy GNC to do um, to then manage then how we move these uh, small uh, satellites around. If they go probably beyond about a meter, then they're gone. Um, and so the actual Wi-Fi system uh, it, it itself 
will probably go out to about a kilometre and a half um, because obviously we've, you know, it uses adaptive coding and modulation. So just like any Wi-Fi system, as the link gets worse, the data rate keeps dropping down. That's one of the things that we were going to be doing with our um, uh, Indian partners. Um, but the, the electromagnetic docking system and what the propulsion system was actually going to do is keep them very close. So things would be sort of happening in a sort of space of 10, 15 minutes, all within about a, a meter sort of cubed. So they wouldn't be going very far at all. Cool, excellent. So I think that that wraps it up for this uh, talk. And thank you, both of you, Alex and Chris, uh, for introing us in this.